look at, um, we're going to continue with chapter 25. We're going on part 3 of part 4. So now we're going to look at the, the liver, the gallbladder, the pancreas, which are our accessory organs, and then the small intestines. Okay. So we'll look at the liver. Oh, the small intestines. They're the ones that's going to receive the chyme. So now we've left the stomach. Well, we've left the esophagus. We left the stomach. It's considered to be chyme now, and it's on its way into the small intestines. Now they're the ones that's going to receive the the chyme from the stomach. Now, um, when it's in the stomach, it's going to be when it's in the small intestines, it's going to be receiving. Um, secretions from the liver as well as from the pancreas. Now these secretions are going to enter the digestive tract near the junction of the stomach and the small intestine. So that area right in here. Now these secretions are important to the digestive of, to the digestive process of the small intestines. So let's look at the liver and then we'll get back into the small intestine. So this liver, this liver, you guys should be very familiar with it. It's reddish in color. It's located near to the diaphragm, um, and it is the body's largest gland, weighing approximately 1.4 kilograms or three pounds. Now it has many functions, of which only one, the secretion of bile, contributes to digestion. Now it has four main lobes. When we look at these four lobes, we have a right, a left, a quadrate, and as well as a as, as a caudate. Now interiorly, interiorly the right and left lobes are visible and are separated from each other by the um, phallicoform ligament, which we see right here. My follicle form lig ligament. We have our left lobe and my right lobe that are divided or separated by this um, follicle form um, ligament. Now, the round ligament, also called the ligament teres, is also visible anteriorly and is a remnant of the umbilical vein. Now, from the anterior view, the quadrate lobe. Here we go. The quadrate lobe is seen next to the gallbladder, and the tail-like quadrate lobe is posterior to that. Now we have an irregular opening between these two lobes. The portal, sorry, the porta um, hepatis which is a point of entry for the hepatic portal vein and the proper hepatic artery which we'll see in a different um, in a different diagram. Here we go. Here's our hepatic um, artery and of course our, uh, our portal vein. Now the gallbladder which you see right here and in green it adheres to depression on the inner surface of the liver and it's between the right and the quadrate lobes. Posteriorly, the liver, it exhibits a deep groove called a sulcus that accommodates the inferior vena cava. Now the superior surface has a bare area where it attaches to the diaphragm. And the serosa covers the rest of the liver. So here is our right lobe, here is our left lobe, and in the middle that separates this ligament that separates the two is called that round ligament. No, this sorry, <laughs> that separates the two sorry is our follicle form ligament, and at the tail end of it is our round ligament. Looks like an umbilical cord, and you see a little tip, this green area right here. This will be our gallbladder. This is our anterior view and at the top you see this um, inferior vena cava. In the posterior view we see it a lot better where we see this superior vena cava and that little um, deep groove or the sulcus area, sulcus 
which is a deep groove within the um within the within the liver is what holds the superior the inferior vena cava which is the that blood vessel that will take the the blood towards the heart right and also we see also we see in the um porta um hepatis we see um the hepatic portal vein the hepatic um, hepatic artery proper as well as the bile duct and of course our bile and this area is our um, a quadrate lobe we have our right lobe right here and here's our bigger area and our our caudate lobe so let's go ahead and look at the microscopic view um, or microscopic anatomy of the liver now the interior of the liver is filled with these tiny, tiny um, cylinders called hepatic um, lobules, and they're about two millimeters long by one millimeter in diameter. Now, lobus consists of of several, oh, sorry, of a central vein uh, surrounded by radiating sheets of cuboidal cells called hepaticocytes. Let me get this one. Here we go. There are hepatical sites. All right. Okay. Now each plate of hepatical site is an epithelium, one of two cells thick. Now the spaces between these plates um, are blood-filled vesicles called hepatic um, cyanoids. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Here's hepatic hepatic cyanoid right here, and they're lined with um, Fenestrated epithelium, endothelium. Sorry. Now the hepatocytes have a brush border of microvilli villi, that project into the cyanoids. Now blood that filters through the cyanoids they come directly from the stomach and the intestines. The hep the um, hepatocytes they absorb nutrients from this and also remove and degrade hormones, toxins and bile um, pigments and drugs. The, the hepatocrocytes um, also secrete albumin, lipoproteins, clotin factors, angiotensinogen, and other factors in the blood. Between meals, they also break down stored glycogen. Now the cyanides also contain um, Hepatic micro, um, microphages, also called cuffer cells. Now, and they are going to remove any type of bacteria or, or, or debris that, that, that's left inside of there. Alright, so let's jump ahead to our bile canaculi. Now, the liver is going to secrete bile into these narrow channels called this bile canaculi. And they're between um, the back-to-back -back layers of the hepatocrites within each plate. So here we have um, um, hepatocrites, and here we have the bile canaliculi. Okay. Let me keep saying canaliculi. Canal canaliculi, which are these small little channels that you see here, where the bile is going to be secreted out from the liver. Okay, this bile is going to pass through those particular ducts of triads and then ultimately into the right and left hepatic ducts. Now the hepatic ducts they converge on the inferior side of the liver to form the common hepatic duct. Now a short distance further on uh, is going to join with the, with the cystic duct coming from the gall bladder. Now the hepatic lobes they're going to be, um, well, let's stick with this one. Um, near the duodenum, the bile duct is going to join ducts of the pancreas. Forms expanded chambers are called the hepatopancreatic ampulla. And they seem to terminate in a fold of tissue. Now, the major duodenal papillae, they consist of um, muscular hepato hepatopancreatic sphincter 
also called the Sphinx of Ode or of Odi. And they're going to regulate the passage of bile and the pancreatic juice into the duodenum. Now between meals, this sphinx is going to close and prevent the release of bile into the intestines. So here I have a picture of the common hepatic duct. We have our cyst duct coming from directly from the gallbladder. And they're going to join up and form that bile duct that will secrete into the small intestines. Well, that, well yes, the small intestines would be that small area of the duodenum. Okay, so let's look at the gallbladder now. Gallbladder, another one of the accessory organs, is a pear-shaped sac on the out on the on the underside of the liver, and it's going to store and store and um it stores and concentrates the bile. Now it is about 10 centimeters long and is lined with a highly folded mucosa with a simple columnar epithelium. Now its head, its head is considered to be the fondest and it usually projects um, slightly beyond the inferior margin of the liver. Okay, so you see that the picture may have <laughs> has changed. Um, I went ahead and I just added a picture so you guys see exactly what I'm referring to when you look at the, this pear-shaped um, this pear-shaped organ in the body, the gallbladder. And we look at the different types, the different areas of the gallbladder itself. So when we're talking about the head, this is the, the head right here, or also called the fondest region. And this is the one that, that the book talks about and it says how it projects slightly beyond the inferior margin of, of the liver. And this ear up here is the neck or the, the cervix is what leads to the, um, the, the cystic, um, the duct. So now you can see exactly what it looks like, especially, sorry, especially the length, how it's approximately 10 centimeters in length, okay? Now you get a visual how, of what everything is looking for, looking like, okay? All right, so what is it secrete? It secretes bile, and bile is this yellowish, yellow green fluid that contains these minerals, the cholesterol, the, new, the, the neutral fats, poly, uh, the bile pigments, the phospholipids, as well as the bile acids. Now, the primary pigment is the bilirubin, and it's derived from the composition of hemoglobin. Now, bacteria of the large intestines, they're going to metabolize the bilirubin to urobilirubin, ruligan, sorry, which gives feces that, that dark color. So here we have the bilin, and they're going to be um, metabolized to urobilirubin. Uh, sorry, urobilinogen, bilinogen, sorry. And that's what gives that the feces that dark color. Now, in the absence of this bile secretion, the feces are grayish white and marked with streaks of undigested fat, which would be that alcoholic feces, is what they'll call it. Now, the bile salts, also called bile acids, um, they're steroids synthesized from um, cholesterol. That together with the, the the lecithin, they add in fat digest. They aid in fat digestion as well as absorption. So these bile salts, along with the with the lecithin from the cholesterol, synthesized from cholesterol, um, along with the lecithin. Sorry, they're going to aid in fat digestion and with um, fat absorption. So all together, these components of the of bile are wastes designed for excretion. And if these wastes become excessively concentrated, um, they may form gallstones. And everybody should be familiar with what gallstones are. Okay. Now bile gets into the into the gallbladder by first filling the bile duct, then overflowing into the um, the gallbladder 
Now between meals, the gallbladder is going to absorb about, uh, it absorbs water and electrolytes from the bile and it concentrates it, um, concentrates it by a factor of five to ten times. Now the liver, it secretes about 500 to 1,000 milliliters of bile per day. Now about 80% of the bile acids are reabsorbed in the, in the, um, in the ileum, which is that last portion of the small intestines, and are um, returned to the liver, where the, hepa where the hepatocytes, they're going to absorb them, they're going to resecrete them, and that process is called enterohepatic circulation. Now this process, it uh, reuses the bile acids two or more times during the digestion of a meal. Now the 20% the 20 that is not absorbed is secreted in the feces. This is the body's way of eliminating excessive or an excess of cholesterol. The new bile aids the new bile acids are synthesized from cholesterol to replace the quantity lost in the feces. Alright, so let's look at a, a couple of terms here. We have gallstones um, and lithotripsy. These are some terms that you will, I definitely you will see again, such as the formation of gallstones. We have the hard masses in either the gall in, in the um, gallbladder or the bile ducts. Those are the gallstones, and the um, composed of cholesterol, calcium bicarbonate, as well as bilirubin. And this term here, which deals with the formation of gallstones, just the one that it's most common in obese women over 40, with an with an excess of cholesterol. We have also a painful absorption of um, obstruction of, of, of ducts, and that's in a result of jaundice, poor fat diet, I mean, yes, fat diet or digestion, I'm sorry, and impaired absorption of fat soluble vitamins. And we have um, lithotripsy, which is uh, the use of ultrasound vibration to um, pulverize stones without surgery. So if someone has gallstones, they'll use this particular uh, procedure to sort of break up the, the, um, the stone, which is well, the pulverize, break up the stone so that it can be um, released. Alright, so we're here on to the kidneys, which sits um, very close to the stomach, as well as um, very close to the liver. It is a spongy um, gland that's posterior to the greater um, to the greater curvature of the stomach. So here's our cur greater curvature of the stomach. It sits behind that part, which is posterior. And it's approximately 12 to 15 centimeters long and 2.5 centimeters thick. It has a few areas. It has a body, and that body is in that midsection. It also has a blunt tapered tail on the left hand side. It is both an it is both endocrine and an exocrine gland. The endocrine part it involves the the um, pancreatic um, islets which secrete the insulin and the glycogen. Now about 99% of the pancreas is exocrine, which secretes 1,200 to 1,500 milliliters of pancreatic juice per day. Now the cells of this, um, the cells of the secretory um, acne is, it exhibits a high density of rough ER and the zymogen um, granules. which are vesicles filled with secretion. Now the, the acne, they open into the system of the large ducts that eventually convey on the main, on the main pancreatic duct.
which you really cannot see those small ones there, but that's the, here's our pancreatic duct here. Okay. Now the accessory pancreatic ducts, or duct however, they branch from the main pancreatic duct and open independently into the, here we go, into the duodenum at the minor duodenum papillae, which is posterior to that major papillae. Now, the accessory duct allows the pancreatic juice to be released even when the bile is out, is not released. Now, the pancreatic juice is an alkaline mixture of water, enzymes, um, zymogens, sodium bicarbonate, and other electrolytes. Now the acne, they, they secrete the enzymes and the, zymo, and the zymogens, while the ducts secrete the, um, the sodium bicarbonate. Now the bicarbonate it serves to buffer this hydrochloric acid arriving from the stomach. Now the pancreatic um, zymogens are trypsinin, chymotrypsinogen, and the pro carboxin pepsidase, pepsidase, sorry. Those are the three pancreatic zymogens. Zymogens. Now when secreted into the intestinal lumen, the trypsinin is converted to, to trypsin by this particular enzyme called the enterokinase, which is secreted by the intestinal mucosa. Now the trypsin is autocatalytic um, and it converts the trypsin into more trypsin. And the, the trypsin also converts the two other zygomen, zygo, zymogens into um, chymotrin, tr chymotrypsin and the carbo Carboxy pepsidase, sorry. Right, so, so to kind of put this in perspective of as to what's going on with this particular um, um, zymogens, I'm going to draw a little diagram for you guys to help you out with identifying um, the function of, of the purpose of this. Um, this trypsin. Now we already talked about the three pancreatic zymogens. Okay, let me see if I can get my drawing going. Alright, so we talked about the three of them. If you guys look back in your books, is the the trip the trypsinogen, the the chymotrypsinogen and the the um the procarbo the procarboxy pepsidin. So I'm going to initial it as we have our T, we have our C, and we have our P. And those are the four, three pancreatic um, zymogens. So what I was talking about, how um, when, when it's secreted, when it's secreted into the intestinal luminin, the, the T That's my um, or trypsin, my trypsinogen. They're going to be converted, or it's going to be converted, into trypsin. And the enzyme that assists with that is. Is enterokinase, E N T R O kinase. Remember, whenever you hear the word A's or the, the ending, the suffix A's, we're talking or referring to um, an enzyme. And that enzyme basically is secreted by 
the intestinal I'll do an abbreviation intestinal mucosa okay now this trypsin that is formed it has a number of functions or it has a lot plays a huge role and what it does when it says it's an autocatalytic it means it's going to help in breaking it down again it's going to to help break down and it's going to help with converting this um, the trypsinogen again into more trypsin so it's basically going to help in converting this tea into more of itself. It wants to make more trypsin, all right? So what it's going to do, help with breaking down this trips, the trypsinogen back into trypsin. So it's going to work in tripling, quadrupling itself. What else does it do? The, um, the second um, pancreatic zymogen, zymogen, sorry, which is our C, our chymo tri <laughs> oh my word, these pronunciations. The chymo um, trypsinogen, our C, what it does with that, um, it helps with converting um, Okay. And what else it does here, um, it converts the remaining two um, zymogens into other factors that play a role. So what it does, the C, this trypsin helps convert the C into our T. Of course, it will make more trypsin. As well, it helps in converting it into um, chymotrypsin, which is C Y M C H Y M O trypsin. Okay. This trypsin also helps convert our P, which is our pro-carboxypepsidase, helps convert it into carboxypepsidase. So you see that this trypsin plays a huge role in ensuring that we have enough um, trypsin for digestion. All right, so let's get back to our original screen. Okay, so that's dealing with these pancre pancreatic Zymogens. So we have other pancreatic um, enzymes. We have the pancreatic alamase, which is there to digest our starches, our, our, our breads, our carbohydrates. Then we have the pancreatic lipase, which digests um, our fats. We have uh, ribonuclease and dioxy, um, dioxyribonuclease, which digests the RNA and our DNA, respectively. Right, so here's just a, a small another diagram here to show you what's happening when the trypsinogen is um, secreted or released into the um, into the small intestines how this trypsin helps in breaking it down with the help how the the, tri the trypsinogen is broken down into trypsin uh, with the help of the um, enterokinase and how the trypsin comes back around to make more trypsin by converting the trypsinogen into more trypsin. The same diagram I did earlier. 
and of course helping um, this other um, Jamagen broken down into um, another product. Alright, so now we have um, some stimuli. Now secretion is regulated by responses that cause release of pancreatic juices and bile upon three types of stimuli. We have the um, acetylcholine, we have our CCH, and we have our, our, and our, our, our secretin. Now the acetylcholine um, coming from the vagus and the enteric, and enteric nerves, they're going to stimulate the pancreatic um, acne and they're going to secrete these enzymes even before, before food has been swallowed. Now these enzymes are going to remain stored in that pancreatic acne duct and the ducts. However, for release when chyme enters the duodenum, the duodenum. so it's going to be stored until they feel that um, until the chyme is there in the duodenum. Now the CCH, the CCK, sorry, they're secreted or it is secreted by the mucosa of the duodenum and the proximate duodenum in response to fats in the small intestines. Now it's going to, it stimulates the pancreatic acne to um, secrete its enzymes and it has a strong stimulatory, stimul stimulatory effect on the gallbladder from which it gets its name. It induces contractions of the gallbladder and the relaxations of the hepatopancreatic sphincter. Now the third one, our secretin, is produced in the small intestine in response to, to the acidity of chyme from the stomach. Now it stimulates the ducts of the liver and pancreas to secrete sodium bicarbonate to offset the um, hydrochloric acid and then to protect the intestinal mucosa from any type of, of stomach acid. So the, the, the secretin, they're, they're there to stimulate the ducts of the liver and the pancreas so they can secrete this HCL, the, the, um, the hydrochloric acid so that it can protect, it can offset the, the hydrochloric acid from being released so that it can coat the stomach and make sure that the inside of the intestinal um, mucosa um, is protected from the stomach acid. All right, so let's move on to the small intestines. Small intestines. We know it has a number of sections. It has a certain size, but we want to get into, of course, this with anatomy. We're going to deal with the, the structure of it as well. All right, so nearly all chemical digestion and nutrient absorption occur in the small intestines, so-called because of its small diameter. It is the largest part, is the longest part of the digestive tract. And in terms of the gross anatomy, um, when we look at it, it is a it is coiled, it is a coiled mass filling most of the abdominal cavity, inferior. Here's the stomach, so it is inferior to the stomach. and the liver and is divided into three regions the duodenum let me get this mouse working here we go the duodenum the jejunum which is that uh, purplish color and then we have the ileum which is that pinkish area now when we talk about the duodenum the duodenum um, constitute a, constitutes the first 25 centimeters or 10 inches of the intestinal tract and it begins at the pyloric um, valve. Now it, it arches upward, let's go back to the diagram, and what it does it's going to arch upward and it has wrinkles called the major and the minor, minor um, duodenal papillae which you can't see on the outside well in this particular diagram. And this is where the pancreatic 
duct and the accessory pancreatic ducts will enter in this particular area. All that stuff we were talking about with the pancreas and the pancreas and everything being secreted, this is the area that you'll have all the, sec the secretion taking place. Not in the duodenum, not in the ileum, we're talking about the pancreas. This is the region. Now, the name duodenum refers to its length, about that of 12 fingers. Now, it's slightly distal of the, uh, the pyloric valve. And of course, it has its wrinkles. Now, most of the duodenum, along with the pancreas, um, is the retro um, peritoneum. Now, here the stomach acid is going to be neutralized. The fats are going to be uh, emulsified by the bile acids. And, of course, our pepsin is going to be inactivated by the increase in the pH levels. And, of course, our pancreatic enzymes will take over um, after chemical digestion. Alright, so now our duodenum, our duodenum is the first 40%, the first 40% of the small intestine beyond the duodenum. Now its name refers to the fact that early um, autonomous, they typically found it to be empty. Now it, it begins in the upper left quadrant of the abdomen, but lies under or lays mostly within the umbilical region. It has large, tall, closely spaced. Um, let me go back. Sorry, closely spaced um, circular folds with relatively thick and muscular walls and a rich blood supply, giving it. Um, is relatively red color. Now most digestion and nutrient absorption will occur here. Now when we look at the ileum now, um, it forms the last 60% of the posture of the postal duodenal and small intestine. So we're looking at it being about one um, 1 1.6 to 2.7 meters. Now it occupies mainly the hypogastric region and part of the pelvic cavity. Compared with the duodenum, its wall is thinner, less muscular, and less vascular, and it has a paler pink color. On the opposite side, from its mesentric appearance, which is on the, on the back side, which you can't see, the ileum has prominent lymphatic nodes in clusters called um, payer patches. Now the end of the small intestine is the ileo is the ileo um, cecal junction, and that's where the ileum is gonna join with the cecal of the large intestine. Now the muscularis of the ileum is thicker or thickened here to form a sphincter called the ileocecal sphincter valve, which is gonna protrude into the cecum and then regulate the passage of food residue. Now, both the duodenum and the ileum are um, intraperitoneal and thus cover with the, uh, with the serosa that is continuous with the folded mesentery that um, suspends the small intestine from, from the posterior abdominal wall. Now, when we continue to look at the layers of the small intestines, we notice that it will have a lumen, and this lumen is lined with this with the simple columnar epithelium. Now the, the muscularis ex externum is obviously the, the thicker inner circular layer and the inner outer longitudinal layer. Now the large internal surface area is produced by the small intestine, relatively great length, and by three folds, three kinds of internal folds or projections. We have the circular folds, which are the largest folds and are transverse to the spiral ridges. We have the villi, which increase surface area by a factor of 10. 
and they actually look like little fingers or, or um, tongue-like shapes. And then we have the microphylli, microphylli, sorry, and they increase surface area by about um, 20 percent, uh, by 20, I'm sorry. I'm going to go to this particular diagram here so you can get a good look of uh, the villi. Sorry, here's the villi that look like um like fingers. Of course, they are the largest in the in the duodenum, and then they begin to get smaller as the regions within those distal regions. So they look a little smaller in the in the duodenum as well as the um, in the ileum regions. Now these villi villus. Now a villus, which is the plural form of villi. You have one villus, ten villi. They're covered with two kinds of epithelial cells. You have the columnar obstructive cells and the mus the mus the mucus secreted um goblet cells. And these cells are joined by tight junctions. And they prevent digestive enzymes from seeping between them. Now the core of the villus is filled with areolar tissue of the lamina propria. Now we do have blood vessels, which we see here in the diagram, blood vessels that absorb most of the nutrients. But the lacto, the lac, the, the lacto, get here the green one here, the lacto, these, this, this is the one that's actually going to absorb most of the, here we go, most of the, of the lipids. Now the core of the villus also contains few smooth muscle cells that contract periodic periodically to mix the chyme and then to move lymph down the, the lacto. Alright, so each ab absorptive cell of the villus, they're going to have these fuzzy looking branches or brushes called the microphylla and they're about one um, nano... Um, micrometer high. So that's not very high at all. You can see them underneath the microscope. Now the brush border, they're going to increase the surface area and they're going to, um, and it contains brush border enzymes in the plasma. Now these enzymes are not released into the lumen but digest the chyme contents as it, as it contacts the brush border. And that's a process called contact digestion. Let's move on because I know it's a lot of information. Um, let's look at the three functions, contraction function, uh, functions of, um, of the small intestines. We have, they are to, to mix chyme with the intestinal juice, bile and pancreatic um, and the pancreatic juice and thus is to make sure that um, is to neutralize the acid as well as digest nutrients more effectively. Second one, to churn the chyme and bring it um, in contact with the mucosa for contact digestion and nutrient absorption. And the last function of the intest small intestinal contraction is to move residue toward the large intestines. Alright, for um, segmentation, I want you to look at that diagram. Here's the information here that we're going to talk about. But I'm going to, to, to turn to your book, or if you have the book open, um, or you can just look at the diagram there, um, 25, figure 25.26a. It shows you a diagram of segmentation. And that deals with the movement in which stationary, ring-like contractions appear at several places along the intestine and then relax as new contractions form elsewhere. Alright, so the purpose of this segmentation is to basically to mix the turn and not to move materials along as um, peristalsis, because peristalsis is just the, the, the wave-like movements. But this is totally different for peristalsis. And they get the, their rhythm 
by these pacemaker cells of the muscularis and um, externa, which is the, one of the layers, um, at about 12 times per minute in the duodenum and then 8 to 9 times per minute in the ileum. Now, um, the slower the rate in the distal regions assists with progression toward the colon. The intensity of the contractions is modified by the nervous and the hormonal influences, but not by the frequency. So peristalsis. Peristalsis, it moves contents of small intestine towards the colon. Now the parasitic wave begins in the duodenum and it travels 10 to um, 70 centimeters and then it dies out only to be followed by another wave that begins a little further down the track. Now these successive overlapping waves are called migrating motor complex. Now, over a period of about two hours they move the chyme toward the colon. A second complex then expels the residue and bacteria from the small intestine thereby helping to limit um, bacterial, bacterial um, colonization. Now the refilling of the stomach at the next meal suppresses the peristalsis and reactivates segmentation. Now the, ileo, the ileocecal valve is usually closed but food in the stomach is going to trigger um, both the release of the gastrin and the gastroileal reflux, both of which will go, are going to enhance that segmentation in the ileum and then it's going to start to relax that valve. Now, as the cecum starts to fill, the pressure, it pinches the valve shut and it prevents the, the reflux of the, of the cecal contents into the ileum. All right, so yes, it is a lot of information that we are we've covered so far in parts one, two, and three, going into grave detail um, with the various parts of the digestive system. Um, but it has to be covered, and you guys have to be very familiar with this information. Um, so in the next um, part, well, in the final part of chapter 25, we're going to look at the... Um, uh, we're going to look at the remaining parts of the digestive tract, the large colon and um, and the, the, the rectum area, okay? And then we're going to look at chapter 26. I think I have a few videos for you for that, okay? Um, so if you have any questions, again, post it on Blackboard in the discussion area, and I'll be able to answer them for you. Go ahead and start looking at part 4.